Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're just going to give it a few minutes to let everybody come in. Just gonna give it a few more moments. Okay, I think we'll get going. Um, hello everyone, and on behalf of Oxford Migration Studies Society, welcome to the annual conference. Um, as you may know by now, I'm Bella, one of the co-presidents um, alongside Sarah, who is on tech this morning. Thank you so much for coming. And if you were with us yesterday, welcome back. And I hope you're enjoying the presentation so far. I know I woke up really inspired and very excited for the rest of the week. Before we get into it, just wanted to take a moment to flag some logistics. Um, after the panelists present, there will be a Q&A. So please feel free to type questions into the Q&A box as you think of them with the name of whoever the question of, is, whoever the question is directed to, if that's applicable. Um, and you also have the choice to upvote each other's questions. But now I'd like to introduce the chair, Eva Seiro Speakerman. Eva is a DPhil candidate at the Center for Criminology. Her research explores migrants' resistance to coercive state power at border sites in Germany and France. Departing from migrants' practices of resistance, her research examines the nature of immigration and border control in contemporary Europe. In particular, she's interested in the role of non-state actors and in how humanitarianism and human rights practices shape bordering processes. This project is supervised by Professor Mary Bosworth. Eva is an organizer and advocates an advocate of migrant rights with seven years experience in the NGO sector and in grassroots organizations in Germany, Belgium, Denmark, France, and in the UK. She completed her bachelor's degree in media and cultural studies at Heinrichheim University Dusseldorf and her master's degree in global studies at University of Leipzig and Roskilde University. And I will let them take it from here. Enjoy. Thank you. Welcome everybody to um, this, the second panel on um, detention, uh, encampment and deportation. Um, and what I'm sure will be an incredible range of presentations and uh, fantastic speakers. Today's presentations take us from the UK to West Africa, Japan and the US. We will hear about the increasing carcerality of border control, the different actors involved and how the ongoing global COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the violence of border control. We will also hear how coercive practices of detention, encampment and deportation can in fact go hand in hand with humanitarian rationales and with deliberate mobility and circulation. Finally, on a more positive note, the presentations also address possibilities of political response and mobilization. And without further ado, I will, it's a pleasure to introduce you to the speakers of the first presentation, Dr. Martina Tazzioli and Dr. Francesca Esposito. Martina Tazzioli is lecturer in politics and technology at Goldsmiths University. She is the author of The Making of Migration, 
the Biopolitics of Mobility at Europe's Borders, published in 2020, as well as of Spaces of Governmentality, Autonomous Migration and the Arab Uprisings, published in 2015, and of Tunisia as a Revolutionized Space of Migration, published in 2016. She is co-editor of Foucault and the History of Our Present, published in 2015, and of Foucault and the Making of Subjects, published in 2016. Martina is on the editorial board of, journal, of the journal Radical Philosophy. Her new book project is entitled Border Abolitionism, Migration Containment and Genealogies of Struggles and Rescue. The second speaker of the first presentation is Francesca Esposito. Francesca completed her, completed her PhD in community psychology at the ISPA University, of, University Institute of Lisbon in 2019 and is currently a British Academy Newton International Fellow at the Center for Criminology at the University of Oxford. Her research focuses on immigration detention in Italy, Portugal, and the UK, and in particular on the gendered and racialized experiences of women confined inside detention centers. She's also a member of the feminist NGO Be Free and an associate director of border criminologies at the University of Oxford. And with that, I will um, hand over to Francesca and Martina. Thank you, Eva, for your introduction. Thank you to the conference organizers for this wonderful opportunity. And so our presentation will be about the economies of migrants confinement in the UK. And uh, uh, as many of you probably know, since 1999, the UK adopted a, dis a dispersal strategy policy to govern and control asylum seekers' presence in the country. So since then, the sites to house asylum seekers and contain and detain them have multiplied, and more recently, even hotels and military sites have been used as temporary accommodations. In particular, it dates back to September 2020, right after the first wave of COVID-19, the decision of the UK government to commission Penali Camp in Pembrokeshire and Napier in Kent, previously disused military barracks to house people seeking asylum in the UK, blaming the pandemic for lack of available housing in the community. And despite being defined as contingencies for temporary accommodation, for asylum seekers who would later be moved to dispersed accommodation, such as hotels, the Home Office announced that these sites would be used for 12 months. So in September, around 700 people were initially taken to Penali and Napier, all single men and the majority of them channel crossers, despite the protests undertaken by migrant rights groups, and solidarity groups and asylum seekers themselves uh, contesting uh, the inhumane conditions uh, of, these, of these sites. And here you can see some photos of uh, two demonstrations held in front of these sites where we also participated. So um, since the very beginning, allegations of overcrowding, scarce access to healthcare and legal advice, poor hygiene standards, inadequate provisions of preventive protective equipment were shared by the asylum seekers confined in these sites. Uh, and overall, they claim to being subject to cramped and unsafe conditions, which expose them to high risk of contracting COVID-19 and eventually die. Plus, as many also noted, uh, uh, although not being classified as detention centers, these military sites bear many of the hallmarks uh, of detention, almost operating as open prisons. So uh, and here you can see some photos of uh, these cramped prison-like facilities. So asylum seekers were left for months in these harsh conditions of confinement, isolation, neglect, and abandonment, while outside, a third and far more deadly wave of COVID began to ravage the country and the third national lockdown was declared. So uh, inside the camp, the men started to uh, put in place improvised strategies of survival, like sleeping out of the dormitories to avoid contracted COVID-19. And here are some images of the Napier barracks. And desperate for this situation, 
some ones so far as even trying to commit uh, self-harm and attempt suicide. So in these months, Martin and I maintained the contacts with two young guys confined inside Napier, who we met at the solidarity demonstration in October, uh, I showed you before. And um, beyond suffering for the special isolation in this remote site, as well as for the racist attacks of far right groups, our friends repeatedly highlighted the uncertainty they were subject to, as well as the disinformation about their rights and legal aid entitlements. Particularly, they told us they, don't, uh, they didn't know why they had been taken to Napier, and despite having asked for this information several times, they didn't know how long they had to remain at that site. Um, they, also, they had also contacted Migrant Help, which is a charity writing the helpline to provide advice to asylum seekers, but the only information they were given was to await for the Home Office decision. So this condition of induced uncertainty and confusion was common amongst all the men in these sites. And as a result, many people started to engage in protests and hunger strikes for being kept in the dark about their asylum cases, as well as for the unsafe conditions they were exposed to. And here you can see some images of these protests. And this situation increasingly worsened until in January 2020, a COVID-19 outbreak occurred in Napier and approximately 200 people of the 400 confined at that time uh, tested positive to COVID-19, including uh, the two to our friends. In this moment, Napier turned into a giant bubble of infection and people who tested negative were even often forced to share sleeping accommodations with sick ones. And here you can also see the statement of the Home Secretary Priti Patel blaming asylum seekers for this dire situation. So the tension and frustration inside the camp raised to the point that at the end of January 2021, one of the blocks in Napier barracks was set on fire. So, uh, uh, although condition within Panali and Napier were particularly harsh, I think it's also worth mentioning that evidence of unsafe conditions and outbreaks of COVID-19 also emerged in some of the hotel accommodations used to uh, house asylum seekers across the country. And I think I'm gonna stop here. Um, uh, Martina can take over from here. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. So uh, building on what Francesca just illustrated, I try to highlight our three main uh, conceptual point uh, in this paper that are also uh, encapsulated in our title, Crumb, uh, Disperse and Cheat. So uh, in our view, a focus on the spatial tactics enforced by UK authorities for illegalizing and destituting asylum seekers show that cramping and dispersing are key political technology of migration governmentality. As Francesca mentioned, of course, there is a long standing and consolidated history in the UK of dispersal that was officially implemented in 1999. And, and however, we think that is interesting to observe how today in this present moment, the present moment is characterized by a mix of centripetal and centrifugal modes of governing. So confining and housing refugees in hybrid sites of detention and dispersing them across the country. And more precisely, what we observe building, I mean, I'm just um, building on what Francesca just illustrated regarding the condition in the Napier barracks, uh, this production of unsafe environment. During the pandemic, the confinement of asylum seekers in the UK and in Europe overall, so for us, the UK is also a lens for understanding what is going on in Europe at large, has been justified through hygienic humanitarian rationale of what we call contain to protect. So basically migrants have been housed slash detained in the name of their own protection, right? Protection against the exposure to the virus, but also of citizen, protecting the citizen against migrants as potential vehicles of contagion. So, and indeed, as uh, Francesca um, showed with this image of the, of the, of the hotels, some of the asylum seekers who are like detained slash housed in the barracks have been temporarily transferred to hotels, uh, such as this one um, close to uh, Etro Terminal 2. And also this is not a new strategy per se. So the use of the hotel uh, in the UK is not new. And however, for us, it is interesting um, that in this moment, 
the use of the hotel on the one hand has been like uh, um, multiplied, enhanced, but on the other, and in particular, this should be situ situated within what we call a confinement continuum. So hotels are, use, are notably used at the moment for um, uh, confining travelers who come from uh, um, countries that are on a red list and also asylum seekers um, that um, are, are waiting to be uh, dispersed. And it's interesting that some of the organization we uh, interviewed, I mean, they all stress, like such as migrant help that uh, Francesca mentioned, uh, this need of, so this logistical problem, infrastructure, logistical problem of where to, in this, mo this moment of COVID-19, we don't know how to uh, manage the presence of asylum seekers, right? We don't know how to disperse them in the country because of COVID-19, there are restrictions in dispersing them. So we need to deal with this present. However, and as a third point, so as I said, cramp and disperse, we, uh, we think that spatial tactics of confinement and dispersal are intertwined um, with obstruction to the asylum procedure, which are predicated on cheating asylum seekers and disorienting at asylum seekers. So in order to grasp what um, Ruth Gilmore defined as the organizing abandonment enacted by the state, we think that we need to analyze together um, how this how these spatial tactics, cramp and disperse, are articulated with administrative violence predicated on cheating and disorienting migrants. And this way of cheating um, for us is not necessarily the result of a unique deliberate strategy enforced by a single actor, but is rather um, the result of a circulation of misinformation in the camps, for instance, in the barrack about the access to the legal aid. And we are happy, I mean, we are running out of time, but happy to speak more about it. Uh, and also how to get in touch with the authorities. So there is this announcement of obstacles um, to uh, get access to, um, not only to international protection, but to uh, the asylum uh, system as such. Uh, and to the multiple bureaucratic steps. And so for us it's important, so while immigration literature, spatial tactics of migration governmentality and the governing through disorientation are often uh, analyzed separately, we uh, argue that we need to analyze these together. And to conclude, um, uh, um, we, so we building on these uh, specific case studies, for us this, the, the UK, the current UK context um, is also a moment of reflecting on how to rethink a critique of the border regime in light of this multiplication of the confinement continuum. So on the one hand, how to undo this confinement continuum without ending up in this trap of humanitarianism. So the, the transfer from the barracks to the hotels on the one hand is, a, of course, is good for migrants themselves. On the other, we are aware that, uh, that we are witnessing to a multiplication of hybrid space of detention and, uh, and confinement that are not um, uh, described and recognized as such. So I need to stop here, but uh, happy to speak more about this, uh, also this uh, question uh, in the Q&A. Thank you very much, um, Francesca and Martina for um, a fascinating um, presentation about how spatial tactics um, and also more administrative forms of violence are actually like interrelated. Um, um, I will also remind everybody that um, please use the, if questions come up, please use the Q&A chat box to post questions. Um, we will come back to the, like, we will come back to them at the end. Um, but just so you don't lose your um, train of thoughts. I will now introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Clara Lecadé. Um, Clara Lecadé is a researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research, CNRS. She works on deported migrants protests movements in Africa. She is also working on a history of refugee camps in relation to migration control and of the refugees political organization inside camps. Clara co-edited with Michel Agier, Un monde des camps and après les camps and Trace, Mémoire et mutation des camps de réfugiés with Jean-Frédéric de Asque. She is the author of Le Manifeste des Expulsés, published in 2016. 
She is currently participating um, in the air deportation project directed by William Walters. And I will hand over um, to Clara. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, a huge thank you to the organizer of this conference. I'm very grateful. Uh, my presentation today deals with uh, deportees grassroots movement in Africa. Deportees associations based on a process of self-organization have flourished across Africa since the 1990s. These associations have allowed deportees to exist collectively and to appear in the public sphere as political subjects. By sharing their experiences, the deportees have invented a micropolitics which opposes deportation policies, but which also may be instrumentalized by states and the International Organization for Migration to complement deportation devices with social activities. The forms of mobilization initiated by self-organized deportees constitute what I call a politics of experience because it is the experience of deportation that underlies the legitimacy of speaking out and moving to the register of collective action. What is at stake is the conquest of an unmediated presence and voice that would allow those primarily affected not only to organize for survival in the post-deportation period, but also to bring out from this experience the political issues underlying the border regime. The origin of this movement of deportees in Africa can be traced back to the pioneering initiative of the Deportees Malian Association, Association Malian des Expulsés in French, whose creation in 1996 in Bamako, Mali, has marked the beginning of a movement through which the deportees try to face institutional abandonment and social stigma by coming together and reappropriating the term of their prejudice to give themselves a name and assume a collective existence in the public sphere. The Deportees Malian Association has developed a radical critique of state policies, condemning expulsions, calling for their halt, denouncing the complicity of African states with Western states. This radical critique of the state insists on the idea of a double responsibility of a shared wrong between the states that deport people and the states of origin of migrants. In 2008, the Deportees Malian Association launched the Bamako call to call for an end to deportations and in the same time launched a campaign to stop Malian government signing a readmission agreement with France. In the wake of the Deportees Malian Association, other associations were founded in the years 2000 and 2010 in Mali, Togo, Cameroon, Sierra Leone. These concomitant initiatives were nevertheless autonomous. They were sometimes inspired by each other, exchanged knowledge and practices of struggle and organized joint mobilization. But some of these associations also held antagonistic positions, depending on whether they condemned deportations or relayed the deterrent messages of the International Organization for Migration and the Europe European Union to stop departure from Africa. These associations grew in various national political contexts that impacted their room for maneuver in terms of freedom of expression and mobilization in public spaces. 
Nevertheless, in their very heterogeneity, these associations contributed to shape post-deportation life, to make the deportees emerge as a collective presence and shape expulsion into a political experience. Deportation policies are indeed without subjectivities, seeking to invisibilize deportation and send deportees back to a blind spot. Deportees collective organization shows the possibility of a political response and of forms of solidarity and mutual aid in the face of the hegemonic and unilateral dimension of evictions. The deportees give voice to an experience that was once silenced and shameful. By coming together, they allow the emergence of political questions born from the depths of their experiences. They give shape to deportation as a collective experience while demanding to be considered as political subjects. Their appearance in the public sphere raises issues related to the relationship between intimacy and politics, between personal experiences and the legitimacy of refunding politics and public intervention by those who are directly affected by deportation policies. The shaping of this experience took different forms, stories and testimonies in the media, claims of abuses and theatrical performances on deportation and on its aftermath. In a video shot in Freetown, the network of ex-asylum seekers in Sierra Leone has staged what they call the agony of expulsion. With this antiphon repeated in a monotonous and tired tone, quote, it's not easy for the deportees. The network of ex-asylum seekers in Sierra Leone stresses the social stigma, death, and condemnation in the society of origin, as well as the extreme fatigue and unrecorded deaths induced by deportation. In this process of politicization, of creating the ground for a common experience, Deportation has resulted in speeches and slogans, like those printed on the network of ex-asylum seekers in Sierra Leone's t-shirts. Quote, deportees are not criminal, up against deportation. Police brutality during deportation is inhuman or don't stigmatize don't stigmatize us, make us feel belonging. To think of deportees' self-organization as a politics of the experience leads us to reflect on how the violence of deportation and its aftermath can be said while claiming a status as a political subject. The network of ex asylum seekers in Sierra Leone's motto, quote, deportations are not victims, they are activists, suggests that the experience of the deportees can be the basis of a policy of struggle and not a subject of compassion that locks the expelled into a position of passive and suffering subjects. The register of lamentation, it is not easy for the deportees, coexists and does not contradict the fact that this complaint may become a source of collective transformation and political emancipation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clara, um, for your insights. I find particularly interesting how um, practices, state practices that are designed to be really individualized, actually, through um, the case study of these deportees movements um, across Africa, are really like forming a collective um, basis for political struggle, which um, 
is fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really um, happy to present you to our next speaker, um, Mariri Nino. Um, Mariri holds a BA in Social Studies from Sofia University, Tokyo, and is currently a master's student in the Masters of Migration Studies at the University of Oxford. She led a research group that interviewed asylum seekers in Tokyo from West Africa and the Middle East at Sofia University. She is currently working on her dissertation and on how multicultural coexistence, a social cohesion policy, is implemented at the regional government level in Japan. Her research interests include city level coalition building, media and migration, migration and asylum policies in Japan. And I will hand over to Mariri now. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm honored to be a part of the conference today. So today I'll be speaking on the topic of asylum seekers at the Shinagawa Detention Center in Japan. As we have heard from previous panelists, governments have taken increasingly punitive measures, including detention, to control and manage migrant flows. This may sometimes come at the expense of the rights of asylum seekers. Japan is no exception. I want to start today by showing you a clip from a film produced by Baberin, whom I worked on a research project with during my undergr undergraduate degree in Japan. We interviewed over 70 asylum seekers from West Africa and Middle East in the Tokyo area. My talk will largely consist of a preliminary findings from the project. Shinagawa enters Shinagawa on the 5th of October 2018. I left Shinagawa 27 February 2020. That long. One year, four months. I, I was arrest for two years and 18 days and I was two years and 18 days in shock. Immigration Detention Center. But it's not that. It's a jail. The film is about the Tokyo Regional Immigration Bureau, pictured here, commonly called Shinagawa Immigration by most of the asylum seekers we interviewed. It's located in the heart of Tokyo and is one of 17 such facilities in Japan that asylum seekers are put in after they refuse the deportation notice from a failed asylum application, for example. To give you a background on Japan's handling of asylum seekers, it's useful to look at Japan's global image and its reality. As this graph shows, Japan's contribution to the UNHCR holds quite a big portion. It's ranked third after US and Germany. Active refugee support is an integral part of Japan's global image. This graph shows the increasing number of asylum applications in Japan, over 10,000, making Japan a somewhat popular destination country for asylum seekers. However, the acceptance rate has remained surprisingly low, below 1% throughout the decades. Until recently, Japan's low numbers have not attracted much attention or required much explanation. Increased media awareness of the global refugee crisis and the result of the 2017 intake of refugees brought this issue to the surface. 20,000 applications and 20 acceptances made for eye-catching headlines. Moving on to detention, which is the topic of our panel today, I want to draw on Victor Turner's notions of liminality to explain the effect of detainment on asylum seekers in Shinagawa. Detention rate is on the rise, as you can see from this graph, and a substantial portion of them are asylum seekers. Here, as Barbarin and Slater point out, Japan is using detention not as a temporary location until trial or repatriation become possible, but as a punitive measure to punish already persecuted refugees for the mistake of seeking asylum in Japan. What's more is that detention is indefinite, unlike the EU, for example, which caps its limits upwards to six months. There is no such rule in Japan. 
As you can see here, quite a substantial number of people are detained over two years. Here, our informant explains what this prolonged detention means for his situation and the state of social limbo that is created in effect. When you start thinking about being outside, when you think about your past, your future, everything, I'll try to remove everything that hurts me. I tried, and I succeeded. And that's what kept me going. That's what made me always smile. Because I had to stop thinking about the situation happening in Cameroon, what I've been through, what is happening, what is going to happen to me at the Cotton Harbor out there. I had to move my life forward. I had to move, I had to move memories. Here, from borrowing from Turner, detention centers are suspended in social space. They are outside the boundaries of society, and asylum seekers are not granted their new identity as a refugee due to stringent processing measures, which leads to a sort of social limbo, as he explains. Now we turn our attention to discuss the implication of the pandemic to all these measures. The pandemic further highlights tough conditions at the detention center, such as overcrowding and close spaces where practicing social distance is nearly impossible, where four to eight people are squished into a single room. It was revealed in February last year, as you can see from this article here, that 55 detainees and six officials tested positive at the Shinagawa Detention Center. Here, our informant explains how him and others detained were put in situations where they feared for their safety. Any person contracting a virus, we are all dead. Because the fact that we are here, they don't need us. They want us to go back. And most of us, we don't want our government. We don't even want to see our government. So it means we are dead if we have the virus. That's what I told him. I said, uh, I don't want to contract this virus. <laughs> this, this virus has no boundaries. It knows nobody, no color, nothing. No, us. They need really scared. The rise in positive test cases led to the Japanese authorities promoting the use of provisional release or karihomen in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19 within the facility. So what is provisional release? It is a temporary measure that can only be obtained through paying a bond fee equivalent of 700 pounds. There is no work permit, no access to healthcare and movement is heavily regulated. Our informants express the irony of having been granted provisional release, which gives them temporary freedom without much financial or health support, especially during the pandemic. Because they, why, 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 why congratulations? If they're not happy, わたし、自分の人、順番順番迎えに向かんのはい。as a measure to address problems of prolonged detention, the government released a series of reports in 2020 promising to reform detention measures. I have outlined some of their suggestions on the left side of the slide. The report failed to address long-term solutions to detention and instead placed its focus on deportation and further punitive measures to those who refuse to do so after a failed application, even when they would be faced, uh, even they would face danger back home. Here is one of our informants describing the effect of the threat of deportation on the mental well-being of asylum seekers. I think they do deportation by force uh, in the room because uh, it's a system. It's a dark, uh, hard system because the, to see deportation uh, is the other detainees with a, after that were depressed and in shock also. 
and they want it, maybe they think, do it, let's do it, because the other guys maybe will say, uh, okay, I want to back up my country. They work very well, uh, destroying our brains, our, our feelings. The use of detention across the globe points to the way asylum seekers have been perceived by their government as a threat that needs to be managed and controlled. Detention is justified as a trade-off between asylum seekers' rights and the overall preservation of the refugee protection system, which rewards only those considered authentic or deserving refugees. In Japan, the pandemic has only highlighted the underlying challenges posed by such an unsustainable structure. As the case of the Shinagawa detention illustrates, long-term detention has serious physical and mental health implications for those seeking asylum. In keeping with the conference theme, Borders and Justice, it is important now more than ever to reflect on how and why detention is being used and to think of possible alternatives. In Japan, there is yet to be a comprehensive measure to address all of these concerns. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Nina, for um, the presentation. I actually think it's um, really, really interesting to hear from um, policies and experiences um, in Japan, of detention in Japan, and especially how the COVID-19 pandemic has really exposed the violence, but also how what one would think is um, could be regarded a progressive um, development. This provisional release, Karihoman, um, that you've explained um, so eloquently to us, um, is actually a way to keep people alive, but then actually to release them from detention, but then in fact to um, not provide any support in healthcare. So basically releasing from detention, but still being trapped in, in a system without any kind of um, support to survive. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna now introduce our next um, speakers, um, Dr. Silvia Pizzalis and Dr. Fabio de Blasis. Um, Silvia Pizzalis holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Bologna. She is now research fellow, fellow at the University of Urbino. From 2009, she has been carry, carrying out research between disasters and migrations in Italy and abroad, among others in Sri Lanka, Niger, and Senegal. Her main interests concern the management of emergencies and crises migration policies and forms of resistance. Fabio de Blasis holds a PhD in Global International Studies from the University of Bologna. He works for an Italian NGO as researcher and practitioner. He carried out extensive field work on rural transformations and development, labor and contemporary migration in Sub-Saharan Africa with research experience in Tanzania, Senegal, Eritrea and Niger and I will hand over to Fabio and Silvia. Yeah, here we go. Thank you for, for this opportunity. Good morning. Um, Silvia and I are going to focus on the role uh, of IOM in the EU policy of border externalization uh, in the Niger. <clears throat> Um, Niger is, or at least used to be until a few years ago, uh, one of the major transit migration hub for Western African migrants moving towards Libya, Algeria, and uh, most importantly for uh, EU policymakers in Europe. Um, this feature, however, uh, radically changed since uh, 2016 when, when it was published uh, by IOM. Uh, a number of factors have contributed to the transformation of Niger from what used to be called a, a transit migration state into what we call um, a trapped migration state. And most of these factors have to do with the EU policy of border externalization in transit countries and with restrictive migration policies, both with Niger uh, especially after the adoption of the 2015 law criminalizing regular migration, as well as outside Niger, uh, especially Libya and more recently 
Algeria, which since uh, 2015 has been massively deporting uh, irregular transit migrants uh, to Niger. Over 40,000 migrants have been deported uh, in the last few years uh, at the Niger border. Um, these processes have paved the ground for what we call an externalization of migration management and a forced return migration management through uh, IOM. Uh, IOM operation in Niger uh, increased dramatically after Lavalletta agreements in 2015, and they are currently funded by uh, the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa. Uh, just to mention a few, uh, IOM's operation in Niger include the monitoring and registering uh, for migratory flows with over a million of migrants uh, registered and profiled uh, in the last few years. Um, IOM is also carrying out uh, search and rescue operation in, in Agadez region and uh, is conducting humanitarian rescue operation of deported migrants at the Algeria Niger border. Um, and lastly, IOM is running three, six transit centers across Niger and is implementing what they call uh, assisted voluntary uh, return and reintegration programs from Niger to third countries. Uh, over 50,000 migrants have been uh, returned to their country of, of origin in the last uh, five years, four or five years. Um, according to, to IOM, this program, uh, the voluntary return, is uh, aimed at helping the return of migrants who uh, wish to get back home but lack the means to do so. Uh, it covers the return journey and, uh, and provides uh, an in-kind contribution of $300 for uh, economic reintegration uh, and income generating activities uh, in, in, in the country of origin. Um, in 2019, uh, IOM Niger recorded the highest number of migrants assisted with voluntary return of all IOM missions worldwide. Um, we argue that this program is accelerating uh, a new transformation of Niger uh, into what we call a backward transit migration hub. Uh, and that under the humanitarian umbrella, IOM is playing a key role uh, in the migration control agenda of the EU and within the broader strategy of curbing uh, irregular migration towards and within Europe. Um, at the time of our field works, uh, the, most of the migrants in charge of IAM uh, in its transit centers uh, waiting for repatriation were uh, migrants deported from Algeria. Uh, there was also a small minority of migrants returning uh, from Libya. And we found also a small but increasing number of undocumented migrants uh, caught by the police forces while transiting in Niger and directed to IOM for not so voluntary return. Um, this is a clear sign to us that IOM operation is going well beyond the humanitarian and, and moving instead uh, towards migration, migration control um, and containment. Um, I let Silvia to go further on this. Thank you, Fabio. Um, during our research, uh, we have found um, several critical issues on the way this program uh, is managed and implemented. Uh, firstly, at conditionality, uh, especially for migrants deported from Algeria and rescued by IOM through its humanitarian uh, rescue operation. Uh, these migrants are victims of multiple violation of uh, human rights before and during uh, deportations. Uh, they are left uh, by Algerian authorities in the middle of the desert uh, and are forced to walk uh, 20 kilometers at night until they reach the border uh, where they are rescued by IOM. Uh, as soon as they are um, rescued, uh, they are offered to join the uh, return program. Uh, they have no choice but to access the, the return uh, since it is the only way to access the assistance provided by AUM um, in, the, in its transit center. Assistance in these centers um, is indeed conditional upon signing up uh, for the return. 
uh, and no other real alternative is provided for those who don't want to sign up. Uh, another element of concern is the lack of human, human rights based individual um, assessments, uh, as uh, very few among migrants uh, rescued by IOM are referred for asylum uh, or refugees uh, status, despite the high number of victims of multiple uh, human rights violation. Uh, the third element um, of concern is the lack of voluntariness uh, in the returns, especially for those undocumented trans migrants uh, cut by the police forces and directed to IOM uh, as alternative to uh, detention. Uh, most of the undocumented migrants we met in IOM Transit Center clearly stated uh, they didn't want to go back home. Uh, they had no choice but voluntary return because the police forced them uh, to do so. Um, overall, we argue that uh, the assisted voluntary return um, and reintegration program is not uh, very successful in terms of social economic reintegration uh, in the country of origin. Uh, as many migrants leave shortly after the repatriation program and try many more time uh, to reach Algeria, uh, Libya, and eventually Europe. Um, why we argue that uh, IOM is playing a key role within the EU policy uh, of border externalization, we also found several strategies um, of resistance and survival um, of the site of migrants uh, who are getting familiar with um, IOM and voluntary repatriation and try to subvert and use the aid offered by IOM uh, to their advantage. Uh, many migrants, especially those deported from Le Algeria, uh, use the IOM as a means of accessing immediate help uh, at transit center uh, before attempting to cross the border again. Uh, they initially joined the voluntary return program already knowing they would uh, leave soon the transit centers uh, before the schedule uh, repatriation. Uh, many migrants strategically use the ION channel uh, to finance the return journey uh, to their country of origin and then leave again after a short time. In other words, uh, they consider IOM's voluntary return as an insurance. Uh, others try to take advantage of the voluntary return program to reach alternative destinations, often uh, providing false uh, generality. So uh, to quickly conclude, while EU border um, externalization takes uh, place through humanitarian mechanisms such as IOM's voluntary return, um, migrants still find uh, ways to avoid border, uh, to avoid internal controls, uh, to challenge and to undermine mobility regimes and to keep on the move. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sylvia and Fabio, for that um, fantastic presentation about how, in fact, like humanitarian mechanisms as the IOM's voluntary re return program um, has, in fact, like coercive um, elements to it or is coercive by nature. Um, what I found particularly interested is how you've shown how they are not really like reaching their aims and how those programs can also be reinterpreted by migrants and, and mobilized by migrants for their own purposes and for resistance. Thank you very much. Um, I am now gonna um, present you to our last speaker of today, Halem Tuck. Um, Halem Tuck is a DPhil candidate at the Center for Criminology at the University of Oxford, researching the intersections of citizenship, privatization, and migration control within the US federal prison system. Before graduate school, he served as legal initiatives associate at the New York Immigration Coalition and as a community organizer at the Refugee Resettlement Program in Syracuse, New York. 
Um, Hallam, I will hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Eva. Can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Yes, perfect. Uh, thanks so much, Eva and OMSS for having me on the panel uh, and to all my fellow panelists. That's a uh, yeah, tough job to follow that. That was really, really wonderful. Um, so I guess uh, in my presentation, I uh, would like to look a, a little bit at how the relationship between federal agencies, state and local governments, and private contractors has shaped the spread of in response to COVID-19 within the U.S. immigration detention system. Um, I guess just to sort of give you very basic sort of overview, more than 12,000 people in ICE custody uh, since the start of the pandemic have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, and ICE detention facilities have had an average infection rate that is 20 times higher than the general population and five times higher than that of state or federal jails and prisons. Um, and strikingly and very tragically, 21 people in ICE custody have died uh, since the start of the pandemic, which is almost double the number in 2019 and, and the highest number of deaths in ICE custody, I think, since 2006. So, um, just before sort of diving in more broadly, just to give you a sense of the structure of the presentation, um, I'll talk a little bit very quickly uh, about the data that I've drawn on in my research methods. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by the public-private relationship in this context and how I think it has shaped the US immigration detention system. And then I'll try and draw out three sort of key ways that I think uh, the public-private relationship has shaped the response to COVID-19 within the detention system. And then if I have time, um, I, uh, yeah, we'll just sort of potentially talk about how uh, COVID-19 might, might shape the future of the detention system in the US. Um, yeah, so I should say this project emerged out of conversations and interviews uh, that I was having as part of my DFIL work. Uh, it was very much a sort of, I guess, grounded approach. Uh, it was not something that I uh, sort of set out sort of directly to do, but, it, but in speaking to people in immigration detention, uh, in the US, it, you know, I sort of got the sense that COVID was both drawing out the sort of essential contradictions and forms of violence within the detention system and transforming it in really interesting ways. And so that's sort of been my goal in this project to try and set about understanding and explaining that process. Um, uh, the, yeah, so I guess just to give you a sense of the overview of the detention system in the US very briefly, um, ICE operates a fairly sprawling network of detention facilities across the US. Uh, currently, they have 143 facilities under contract. Um, in 2019, uh, before the pandemic, obviously, ICE booked 510,000 people into detention over the course of the year. And just to give you some sense of comparative scale, uh, according to the Bureau of Justice statistics, there were 576,000 people, I'm uh, sorry, I should say sentenced prisoners booked into state and federal prisons across the country. Um, so uh, yeah, obviously that excludes pretrial detainees, but nonetheless, uh, I think that sort of scale is, is that comparison of scale is useful. Um, detention is a nominally civil form of confinement, but as many scholars and even some federal officials have acknowledged, in practice, the conditions and circumstances of ICE custody heavily blur the boundary between civil and criminal confinement or custody. And moreover, and this is what I'll try and get at in my presentation, while immigration detention is one of the largest systems of confinement in the US, uh, the day-to-day -day management of detention facilities is completely outsourced. So in 2020, 81% of people in ICE custody were in facilities operated by private contractors, and the rest were in facilities operated by local jails or prison systems, or uh, in the very American way of describing confinement, uh, state or local departments of corrections. Um, so uh, this is just some uh, sort of background on people in uh, custody. This is a really interesting map of how the detention system has expanded since 1980. Um, just to talk a little bit about sort of what I mean by the public-private relationship here. Um, I use the public-private relationship as shorthand to refer to the network of relationships between federal agencies, local governments, private contractors, and civil society groups that together exercise practical and legal authority over the detention system. Um, 
And I should say my sort of thinking in, in this approach has been shaped really by the work of Lauren Martin. Um, and also uh, I think Mariki uh, de Gode, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing her, her name horribly wrong, uh, but this idea that the public private relationship is, is not so much a sort of tightly drawn sovereign power, but an apparatus in which diverse and sometimes contradictory elements come together to produce a logic of governing. Um, and I think you can see this in the, in the various sort of contractual relationships that ICE uses to procure and operate detention facilities. Um, without sort of going too into the weeds, I think the important thing to take out of these contracts is that ICE employs a, a, these sort of contractual relationships that mix the logics of incarceration, expulsion, and economic accumulation across the public-private boundary um, and really blur it in, in meaningful ways the public-private private, uh, boundary. Um, I will come back to that in a second. Um, so to sort of try and pick out the first way that I think COVID has shaped, uh, or I should say the public-private relationship has shaped uh, the response to COVID in detention, Allison Mounts and other scholars have described detention as a careful juxtaposition of containment and mobility, of identifying, apprehending, and moving people in tightly specified ways into, across, and out of detention spaces. And I think this process of circulation has been shaped by public private relationships in two really important ways. Um, first, ICE's reliance on outsourced detention beds has created a significant imbalance between the regions where most detainees are apprehended and, uh, the, reason, and the regions where most detention facilities are located. And you can see this uh, in this really interesting graphic from a report on the ICE detention system by uh, DHS Special Advisor Dora Schriro from 2009 sort of visually representing, or yeah, visually representing ICE's idea of what this disjuncture between, so to speak, demand and supply looks like. Um, second, certain ICE contracts contain guaranteed minimum clauses, which means that ICE pays for a certain minimum number of beds, whether or not they're used to incarcerate people. So at the moment, ICE has guaranteed minimum clauses with 49 facilities and pays for roughly 34,000 beds every day. And obviously this in really critical ways shapes how people are moved around uh, the detention system. ICE essentially has a, a really significant incentive to fulfill those minimum agreements. As the testimony of Dr. Scott Allen, who's a prominent whistleblower within DHS has shown COVID-19 has thrown this sort of delicate juxtaposition of containment and mobility into disarray. Um, despite advice from Dr. Allen and other medical experts, ICE continued to transfer detainees uh, throughout the pandemic to alleviate overcrowding and ensure minimum bed space requirements were met. And strikingly, according to analysis by the NGO Detention Watch Network, this failure to halt transfers uh, and take efforts to substantially reduce detention populations was linked to an additional 245,000 cases of COVID-19 outside of detention facilities. And I think to see a practical example of how this played out, we can look at what happened at ICA Farmville, which is a detention facility in Farmville, Georgia last year. ICA Farmville is operated through a intergovernmental services agreement. Uh, so ICE contracts with the town of Farmville, Virginia, who then subcontract to the private contractor, Immigration Centers of America, and ICA uh, then subcontracts to a separate company called Armor Health to provide medical services at the facility. In mid-April last year, uh, Armor Health employee and the facility's chief medical officer, Teresa Moore, sort of sensing that COVID was going to be a, a problem for the facility, worked out a deal with ICE and ICA to halt any new intakes at the facility to prevent the spread of the virus. And yet on June 2nd, ICE transferred 74 detainees to Farmville from facilities in Florida and Arizona. Uh, 51 of these detainees would eventually test positive for COVID-19. And these, these transfers really had drastic consequences, both for the facility and also for the, the community uh, yeah, around the facility. Um, four weeks later, nearly 90% of the detainees at the facility tested positive, and very tragically, one detainee died from COVID uh, at, at Farmville. And so I think we can see here how this sort of public-private relationship uh, shaped uh, the experience of COVID at, at Farmville. Uh, while initially ICE denied that uh, the, you know, the transfers had any 
uh, sort of effect on the spread of the virus, it would come out later that ICE had made this transfer to meet a minimum bed requirement. And they would acknowledge uh, in an after action report that these transfers had played a critical role in spreading uh, COVID around the detention system. Um, beyond circulation, I think the public-private relationship shapes the material circumstances within detention facilities in ways that make people in ICE custody really uniquely vulnerable to COVID-19. And to understand how the outsourcing of detention shapes the material conditions of confinement, I think it's important to understand how value is extracted through the economic relationships within the detention system. So historically in the US, non-state or private practices of incarceration or penal servitude involved extracting value from the labor of confined people. By contrast, contemporary practices of privately operated detention extract value from confinement by cutting the costs associated with the biological and social reproduction of detainees. And I think Lauren Martin has done a really excellent uh, job of describing this in her recent paper on immigration detention in the US. And so in a real sense, when companies like the GEO Group, which is one of the major private contractors in the US, report positively to their shareholders that they've reduced their operating expenses, in a real sense, what they're talking about is saving money or cutting down on, on the cost of keeping people in detention alive. Um, unsurprisingly, uh, this has really exacerbated the spread of COVID-19. Uh, in a national survey conducted by the DHS Office of the Inspector General in April 2020, uh, staff from 188 detention facilities across the country raised concerns about their inability to practice uh, social distancing, chronic understaffing of medical personnel, and shortages of basic sanitary products and, uh, and, and PPE. Um, at Folkston Ice Processing Center, a facility operated by the GEO Group in southeastern Georgia, detainees expressed really a multitude of concerns about the lack of medical care and the inability to get the care that they felt they required. Um, one detainee who I spoke to while I was doing some interviews for my fieldwork told me that uh, he'd received treatment for asthma since 2012, but he hadn't been able to get an inhaler, a salbutamol inhaler from GEO. And so uh, whenever he had an asthma attack, he would share an inhaler with another guy that was in his cell who was very graciously essentially allowing him to use his, his inhaler. Um, and another man at Folkson sort of described the sense of isolation that came from this deprivation saying, uh, you know, in here we only have God with us. To be clear, I think I should say these conditions of deprivation and neglect were well documented well before the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it's striking that one of the most successful legal challenges to the detention regime has come in the form of the Frey Happy Ice case, which is a class action suit that was originally filed in 2019 that challenges the use of nominally civil confinement to incarcerate medically vulnerable and disabled people. Um, and again, I think overall this suggests that the spread of COVID-19 has intensified the existing problems of deprivation and neglect within the detention system and made detainees vulnerable to COVID-19 in new ways. Um, given that I think uh, I'm running slightly out of time, uh, I will uh, perhaps breeze over uh, the last section here and get to the conclusions because I think it would be really great to, to get to the Q&A. Um, and perhaps we can come back to, to the final section in the Q&A. Um, so I think just to sort of draw some, some quick conclusions here, I think in these examples, we can see how the public-private relationships uh, that shape the detention system have played a key role in shaping the spread of in response to COVID-19 in detention. Uh, first, ICE's reliance on local governments and private contractors to provide detention capacity shapes the ways that people move through the detention system and in turn has shaped how COVID-19 has spread uh, and the ways that detainees have experienced the pandemic. Second, by relying on cost-cutting strategies to make incarceration profitable, outsourced detention facilities expose migrants to distinct forms of material deprivation that make them uniquely vulnerable to COVID-19. And I guess more broadly, I think what's interesting about the spread of 19 is that it's plunged the detention system into a sort of new kind of crisis that is both drawn out in really stark relief, the essential contradictions and violence at, at the heart of the detention system, while also in, in certain ways that perhaps we can get to in the Q&A, offer the possibility of really transformative change. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hallam. Um, 
for really dig digging deep into how the surge of COVID-19 and ICE facilities in the US is um, can be traced back to the re reliance on private contractors, um, such as the GEO group, but also others, and also traced back to the rationalization um, of detention and cost cutting, so, so actually economic um, interests. Um, thank you. And yeah, we've arrived at the end of these amazing five presentations. And so we're gonna dive right into the Q&A and there are already really um, interesting questions in the Q&A chat. Um, and I will start by um, bringing up one question to Martina and Francesca before I move on to two other questions, um, which is the following. Um, this is a question for Martina and Francesca. I'm just gonna read it out loud so we can all um, understand the question. Um, this is a question for Martina and Francesca. Thanks so much for your presentation. Is there a political economy angle to the increased use of hotels for housing asylum seekers during COVID? Have the hotel companies perhaps lobbied the home office slash offered their hotels as housing in order to make money during lockdowns? If so, might there be an interesting intersection here with private security companies such as Circo and G4S ask, acting as housing providers in the dispersal system? Yeah, so um, also like especially in relation to, to the presentation we just heard by, by Halam, I don't know if um, Martina or Francesca, you want to react to this question? Yeah, I can say a couple of words and maybe uh, Francesca can develop it. So yeah, definitely the political economy angle is a super uh, productive lens for reading what is going on in our opinion. Um, and in this regard, it's important to say that, um, well, Sarco um, runs most of the hotels that have been, that are currently used for uh, housing, temporarily housing, hosting asylum seekers. Um, uh, so uh, the barracks uh, are run by Clear Spring, and there are three actors involved um, overall in housing asylum seekers, Mears, Clear Springs, and and Serco, and the contract has been renewed in 2019, so before the pandemic. And however, there is a longer history of this like economy of outsourcing uh, asylum seekers, the housing of asylum seekers. 2012 uh, is an important year when this like privatization, outsourcing of asylum seeker services has been boosted. So it didn't start with the pandemic, but our, um, our hypothesis is that uh, the pandemic provided like a, a good opportunity for these private actors and in particular for these three actors to um, uh, gain a kind of monopoly over the like asylum the, the, the housing of uh, of asylum seekers um, and in particular yeah Serco uh, and as I said also Mir and Clear Spring play a key role um, so we notice this concentration right in the end of these three uh, providers. Uh, and in general, yeah, the outsourcing of, like the, the, the lens of outsourcing is, uh, is key for, for uh, analyzing the restructuring of uh, power relation in refugee governance. Uh, maybe Francesca, I don't know if you want to add something. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, you already mentioned the, the key points. Maybe just to add that under this last contract called Asylum Accommodation and Support Services contract of 2019, there was also a national contract for providing uh, helpline and support service to asylum seekers, which was, uh, uh, was given to migrant help. Uh, which I mentioned in, uh, we mentioned in our presentation. And so uh, also is another actor uh, who was introduced in this, uh, um, in this economy, in this business of private actors uh, in, the, in the asylum industry, and which actually plays a key role in our analysis uh, in also contributing to this confusion and conflicting informations, which uh, ultimately 
hamper the access uh, of people to legal aid entitlements. Uh, and as Martina said before, as uh, the, the asylum system itself. So uh, I think someone was asking about uh, about migrant help and what we we realized through this uh, this contact of friendship and solidarity with some of the people inside the barracks was exactly that they were extremely confused about what rights they had what entitlements also in terms of uh, legal support legal aid so uh, Basically, they thought that they were not allowed to receive uh, uh, free legal support in their cases. And this confusion was uh, exactly uh, the result of several actors, uh, uh, which uh, are in, uh, of course, are uh, in this industry, and also the role of migrant health, who, uh, I mean, didn't provide clear information on how to navigate the system. So I think, yeah. Thank you, Martina and Francesca for all, also already um, um, referring to this other question, which asked about the charity's organization role and positionality. Um, it's really insightful, thank you. Um, the next question is um, to Mariri. Um, I think there are a lot of um, people in the audience who found your presentation in the context of Japan particularly interesting. Um, and the question um, says, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Since I feel particularly ignorant about migrant situation in Japan, could you please clarify how asylum seekers reach the country? Right, yeah, thank you for your question and, and for your interest as well. Um, to answer your question and to give a little bit of background in the um, asylum seeker situation in Japan in general, um, most of the asylum seekers are actually from nearby places uh, like Southeast Asians, Filipinos, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Indonesia are one of the top applicants on the list. Um, and there are some others from West Africa and the Middle East also from Iran, Ghana, Cameroon, Nigeria, um, whom we have access to and whom we have um, interviewed. So usually they would come in um, as and kind of going to answer the question that's below it. Um, they are protected by the international law and Japan has ratified the 1951 convention. So all of those rules apply. Um, however, so refoulement applies, applies as well. However, a lot of them are stopped at the border or questioned at the border when they don't have a, a visa. And when authorities assume that the documents required to submit asylum application is not adequate enough, then they are immediately put into uh, detainment, which happens to um, some of our uh, interview interviewees. I hope that answers the question and I can elaborate further. Thank you very much, Nina, definitely. Um, I, um, I'm going to direct the next question at Helen before moving to two questions um, more directed towards resistance and kind of an outlook, um, if that's all right, Helen. So the question is, many thanks for your presentation. To what extent do you think we could characterize ICE as engaging in human trafficking with the way it moves people around the detention estate? and the financial in incentives it seems to have for doing this. So quite an exciting reinterpretation of human trafficking, which yeah, like. <laughs> uh, Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I, this is going to be a frustrating non-answer for you, I'm sure, in the sense that I uh, am sure that there are very particular legal definitions of what human trafficking is, and I don't know them. Um, well, or I, I should say, I, I can't speak to the extent to which uh, ICE's practices of incarceration meet the formal legal definition of human trafficking. Although I will say, I think what's really interesting, and, and also obviously ICE within the legal system has, uh, yeah, has legal authority to, very specific legal authority uh, to confine people for the purposes of making them attend immigration hearings and making sure that they don't uh, threaten public safety, which is, yeah, obviously a very sort of ambiguous uh, 
idea or yeah, very ambiguous term. Um, what I think what I think is really interesting about the way that the circulation within the detention system has played out in terms of COVID is that if you look at the period when the detention system was being built in the 1990s, the congressional officials that were sort of pushing ICE to develop the detention system, their concern really was about people uh, who were being released either from apprehension at the border or from contact with the criminal justice system sort of being let out into the public, so to speak. So there is this really big, very, very racialized moral panic over the release of people, uh, you know, people that uh, the immigration system was letting go because it didn't have enough capacity and it didn't sort of have the yeah, the, the capacity to identify, apprehend, and then transfer these people to detention facilities. And so what's striking is that the sort of solution that federal policy policymakers came up with was uh, these very complicated logistical systems that allow them to essentially, by combining law enforcement databases and investing a lot of money in uh, private contractors, yeah, be very good at moving people around in, in very tightly specified ways. Um, and of course, because of COVID-19, you know, because of the way that the virus spreads in COVID-19 and the risk of uh, moving people around congregate settings, this is like the absolute worst nightmare um, for, uh, for the virus. So I think, uh, yeah, so I don't know if that's answered the question very well, but I do think uh, one of the things that has come out of, yeah, this project for me is, is the sort of way in which COVID-19 has, has played out how important circulation is to the way that uh, the intersection of the immigration system and, and criminal justice system in the U.S. works. Definitely. Thank you, Hallam. Um, the next question is directed at um, Clara Lecade, um, and it's um, quite specific out of um, curiosity around the demands put forward by the deportees uh, movement in Africa. And um, so Laura Martins is asking, could you explain a bit further what are the major divergences between the demands of these different autonomous political groups? Thanks a lot, Laura, for the question. Uh, I, would, I would say that the major difference between this deportees association is uh, between uh, the associations that are uh, critical uh, towards state uh, policies and uh, international migration governance in general, and uh, other associations which are funded by the International Organization for Migration in order to spread uh, dissuasive uh, messages, uh, especially to the African youth, um, in order to stop departures. So I would say that this is uh, the, the major uh, antagonism and difference between these uh, deportees associations. Uh, and uh, in this sense, uh, experience uh, can be uh, the foundation uh, of a politics which can be either uh, confronta confrontational, uh, either uh, some kind of you know that can become some kind of an alley uh, to state uh, policies and it's uh, interesting that uh, uh, depending of, uh, on their political position uh, deportees can become either opponents or allies to uh, state policies and migration governance Thank you, Clara. Um, a really interesting perspectives um, of like opposition, yeah, different ways how how experience can play out and be be used in a way or be mobilized for for resistance. I'm gonna um, be putting forward this really interesting um, question as the last question. I would like to. Um, it's not it's not direct. I think it's it's open to 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 the whole panel i would like to start by addressing it to Fav, uh, fabio and silvia um 
and maybe if some other um, afterwards have um, anything to add, um, we could then um, thereafter close the panel. Um, so an excellent panel. Um, the paper on Japan with direct inputs by people who are being held in those centers was incredibly useful. So too the paper on IOM's role in Africa and all the other papers. My question is, what purpose do such panels and papers serve beyond exposing the dynamics of invisible systems and regimes of control? How can we take one more step to change the status quo? Having worked close to UN member states in the run-up to the Global Compact on Refugees and Migrants and also observed the shift of IOM into the UN system as a central manager of global migration, I cannot see how the work academics like us do has impact or in any ways changes the discourse on migration. What can we or should we do about this? Easy question there for you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for uh, this question. Very difficult, but we will try to answer. Um, in our case, uh, this research was not born in an academic context, uh, but within the framework of international cooperation with a project aimed at understanding the diversity of uh, migratory phenomenon in Niger. Uh, understanding the transformations of uh, this country, often not very uh, well known or uh, misunderstood. Uh, on the basis of the results of uh, this research, uh, a more practical project will be carried out with the intention of implementing uh, real actions uh, in Niger involving the migrants we have mentioned. Um, I don't know if Fabio want to. Um, well, generally speaking, like, generally speaking, I think the work of academics and researchers may actually have an impact on, in the sense of changing the discourse on migration and sustaining alternatives, alternatives, visions and practices. Um, for example, in Niger, there is a debate among uh, civil society organization. Uh, on the role of IOM and political resistance is on the rise because of the work of academics. A uh, few years ago, civil society organizations in Niger were addressing migrants to IOM, but nowadays contestation is definitely rising, as well as alternative forms of assistance from below based, for example, on, on diaspora association. Um, yeah, that, that, that's what I, what I think we could highlight. Thank you, Fabio and Silvia. Um, I was wondering if anybody else in the panel would like to add to, in particular, this last question or, or anything else you would like to add. Um, we will be um, closing the panel in about three to five minutes, um, but I do want to give the chance to anybody who has um, any further comments. Can I, can I invoke my privilege as panelists to ask a question of Martina and Francesca, Eva. Of course. Wonderful. Um, Francesca and Martina, I thought that presentation was incredible and, and really, really timely. I wonder, and it's something that I've been thinking about in the context of, I guess, similar sort of themes in the US, but you talked a lot about how practices of confinement in the UK are very sort of ad hoc, right? Like they come out of these periods where there is tremendous, there's perception of migration, perceptions of migration crisis. And so the state sort of scrambles around and searches for ways to incarcerate people in ways that, that constantly sort of change and, and shift shape. And I think even there was a, a question in the chat box that got this got to this a little bit, but I think it's striking that in the UK, there have been some successes in closing down immigration detention centers. And yet after these periods of migration crisis, we get sort of new new forms of detention in different shapes or contexts. And so I guess I wonder what, because I, I, my sense is that you've been pretty involved with grassroots organizing around sort of closing down detention, how organizers, uh, or I guess academics, or whoever really should respond to the fact that detention seems to be able to sort of shift shape constantly and, and prolong itself in some sense. Jessica, do you want to start now and then I can? Maybe I can just say a few words trying to connect 
this uh, the question before and what Alam was saying. Um, yeah, first of all, I would like to say, I think, uh, I mean, uh, at least in my, my way of, of seeing the research and academic work, I think it needs to be in very, in continuity um, uh, uh, with uh, the, the struggles, the grassroots struggles uh, of people, of activist group, and above all of people with lived experiences who are at the front front of uh, this fight against the, uh, the border regime. Um, so I, I think it's only true, uh, I mean, working together uh, that we, with them and uh, putting our work at the service of them that we can somehow get to, to something, achieve something. Uh, this being said, I think that uh, um, it, it is not uh, just about making visible, invisible forms of, uh, of injustice, of social control, but I think this is the first step to, uh, to build effective forms of resistance and struggle. And I think this continuity, the continuum uh, of, of confinement that Martina was speaking before, I think it's, it's really important to understand this increasing, increasing proliferation of forms of detention, of unofficial forms of detention in Italy. We are now the quarantine ships. We have, uh, we have had hotspots. I mean, it, we are increasingly witnessing and we will witness uh, even more in the future. And it, it's, uh, um, it's important the struggles and all the knowledge we um, we built on the on the detention system and how to challenge the detention system that somehow has led to, to, to closing down of some of some centers. I think it's extremely important and must be used to address these new forms of unofficial forms of detention. And this is what activists and people on the ground are doing. So it's not something that uh, I mean, we need to start. It's something which is already, people are already doing, um, are already connecting this, these forms and using uh, the, the claims and the knowledge and the achievements, uh, the fights we won uh, in, the, in the detention field to challenge these new forms. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I don't think we're, we're running late, so I totally agree that the idea, I mean, the, the, the goal of the stake of our presentation was precisely to not shift the attention, but to broad, to widen um, uh, the, the view from um, the like more like traditional and recognized site of detention to this continuum of uh, confinement that also raise, uh, in our opinion, question around how to situate, how to craft critique, right? Because of course, um, it goes without saying that the hotels are a better accommodation than the barracks. So we shouldn't just say, okay, everything is the same, in particular for the migrants who only who remain in these sites for months and months. But at the same time, we should be aware, uh, we should be carefully not endorsing this um, enforcement and multiplication of hybrid site of confinement that are always um, uh, justified under the guise of okay, humani I mean, humanitarian housing. Thank you. Um, does anybody um, else in the panel want to bring us one last perspective? Um, I'll just give it. Otherwise, I think um, I want to, yeah, I think this was like a good close. Martina, I'm gonna use your, your expression of how maybe academic work can, um, can be a toolbox to craft critique or can be used as, as toolboxes to then craft critique um, and to hopefully um, dismantle these um, systems of confinement. Um, I want to thank everybody, um, especially the panelists, but also the audience for the amazing questions, but uh, um, the presentations were all in each and everyone um, insightful. And thank you so much for um, 
OMSS for organizing this panel. Um, I will hand, or, hand over to, um, I think, Bella um, to close. Yes, today. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you um, to everyone for attending, for Ava for moderating, and of course, for the panelists for your fantastic and timely presentations, highlighting the various violent manifestations of carcerality of border management, particularly so in the context of COVID-19. We are honored you have chosen to share your expertise and time with us. If you are enjoying the conference, please consider making a donation, which can be done through purchasing a donation ticket on our Eventbrite page. Your donations will be split among five organizations, Otros Rims en Acción, State Watch, Oxford Against Immigration Detention, and Border Violence Monitoring Network, as well as Art Connects. Representatives from the organizations are a key component of our next panel, which is at 5 p.m. BST, and it's the Activist Practitioner Panel. We will pick up right where we left off on this panel, essentially looking at the connection of scholarship and activist efforts. It will be a really interesting mixture of local activists, work on the deportee movement, research activism and politics with an activist MEP joining and moderated by Martina, who you heard from on this panel. We'll hear about the practicalities of organizing and resisting the border regime. And once again, it's on the same link. So even if you haven't registered, not to worry, you can still join. Uh, thank you as well to the co-hosts, Routed Magazine, Border Criminologies, and the Oxford Migration Mobility Network. And of course, our OMSS team, Charlie, Jasper, Guadalupe, Philippa, Giovanni, Trin, Asad, and Sahir for your work. If you're not already, if you have not already had a look, the conference special issue is available on the Routed website. Do be sure to follow along on social media for information on the rest of the conference week, and we hope to see you virtually soon. Um, final note, all of the recordings will be available on the Border Criminologies YouTube account. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>